Hi, I'm Arne Swinne, and uh, I'm giving a presentation today about uh, some vulnerabilities I found during bug bounty hunting. Who of you has never heard about bug bounty hunting before? Okay, cool. So uh, I'll get, I'll, I'll introduce that in a, in a minute. But first, uh, I'll introduce myself a bit more. So my name is Arne Swinne. I'm 26 years old, and I'm actually an IT security consultant. So I'm, I'm really in the industry. And what I do is mainly I perform penetration testing. So penetration testing, for those who have never heard of it, I, I <laughs> test web applications in an offensive manner. So I try to hack, let's say, but in an ethical manner. And when I find vulnerabilities, I report them to my clients, mostly in the financial sector in Belgium, and sometimes international clients. So um, I work at Enviso. It's a startup, or almost a startup. Uh, we've been existing for three years now. And before, I, I worked at Verizon as well. Um, you probably never heard of me, but if you did, you might know me from either a presentation I gave at Black Hat uh, 2014, uh, two years ago, about uh, one packer to rule them all, which was a tool that allowed anyone to evade all antiviruses in one sweep with one tool. Um, perhaps you also heard about the Cybersecurity Challenge Belgium. I'm actually one of the co-organizers of this, uh, this challenge. Anybody ever heard of this? Cybersecurity Challenge Belgium? Anybody participated in it? No students here? Are there students in the room, actually? Maybe to, to get to know you? OK, so I'll do not the advert. I will not uh, do the promotional talk for the Cybersecurity Challenge. But basically, uh, for those who do not know it, it's a, it's a capture the flag competition nation, nationwide in Belgium, where actually any student can participate in teams of four, and they can compete uh, for two days. And coincidentally, the qualifiers for the 2016 edition start tomorrow. So uh, if you know any students, uh, feel free to, uh, to let them know, because there's uh, a lot of good prizes to win. Actually, the, the winners of this year's edition will uh, will be sent to Las Vegas to a DEF CON uh, conference. And it will all be sponsored by, by the event. And coincidentally, I just came back from San Francisco yesterday. I went to RSA conference. So forgive me, but I still, I'm still uh, encountering some jet lag issues. That's enough about me. So um, what I will be talking today about you, uh, to you about today is uh, bug bounty hunting. Basically, what is bug bounty hunting? Uh, a couple of the big players in the, in the technology industry, let's say, they have a bug bounty program, public bug bounty program, which means that they actually allow people to attack their applications or attack their, their servers. And if you report it, they will remediate the vulnerabilities and they will award you for it. So you have Facebook, you have Google, you have PayPal, and actually Microsoft as well. And actually more and more companies are getting into uh, bug bounty programs. There's actually platforms where you can subscribe to, like HackerOne and BugCrowd, who are an intermediate, intermediate party who provide you with a platform. And lots of uh, companies are going there to offer themselves to, to researchers. And lots of researchers are going there to see who is interested in, uh, in an examination and, and some submissions. And uh, I mainly focused, actually, what I'm presenting here is mainly the result of my bug bounty hunting endeavors of last year and beginning of this year. And I focused on Instagram. Instagram, as you might know, is, uh, is actually uh, owned by Facebook. And Facebook has a public bug bounty program uh, in which uh, Instagram is in scope. So first, I will uh, I'll introduce a bit more bug bounty hunting and Instagram itself. And then I'll go through a technical setup which I had to had to uh, overcome in order to really start security testing, start penetration testing Instagram. So man in the middle signature, key phishing, and APK decompilation will be discussed. I'll, uh, I'll elaborate on that in a minute. And after that, I will go over all the vulnerabilities I found. There are actually 10 vulnerabilities in total that I have reported and that have been remediated or not. Some, some have not. And uh, I would like to discuss these with you together. So first of all, why did I do bug bounty hunting? Basically, for fun and profit. So I really like to do capture the flag. That's also why uh, I, I actually studied at the KU Leuven. I graduated three years ago, almost four years ago. And at that time, I was also involved in uh, Hacknam style, the CTF team of, of KU Leuven. And I really liked that. And this is actually also why I became a, an offensive security consultant, let's say. And a bug bounty is, is actually pretty much alike. So you have, you have a target, you have a scope, and you, 
you want to find some vulnerabilities in there. And it's also, of course, a good way to, to make some extra cash. So as I've already told you, I've been doing this since April 2015 until now. I spent around six weeks on all of this, mainly in my free time because I have a full-time job. So it was uh, some vacation days were sacrificed. Uh, what do you need to know about Instagram? Um, for those who, I'm pretty sure it's quite familiar with all of you, but for those who, who are not uh, familiar with it, it's basically Facebook for mobile pictures. So it's, it's actually far more simple than Facebook. More in the, in the sense of Twitter, you, have a, you can uh, befriend someone and you can upload pictures that you can share with others. In Europe, it's not that, um, that popular yet, but in America, all the celebrities use this to announce big news or to share pictures. It's really a big thing there. Also in Australia, uh, it's, it's becoming big. They have more than 400 million active users. Facebook has 1.2 billion, but okay, they, they're catching up. And yes, I've, uh, as I've already told you, the reason why I chose Instagram is mainly because it's included in Facebook bug bounty program. And also many researchers that hunt bugs, they also publish write-ups of what they found. Not all of them, but many, many do. And the reason I chose Instagram was because I didn't find many write-ups about Instagram yet. So that's basically told me, or it is a very secure product, or nobody has taken a decent look at it yet. It turned out it was a second one. What do you need to know about Instagram further? Um, the access control model is very simple. You have either a public account or a private account. With the public account, if you upload a picture, it's visible to the whole world. It's just uh, you have a profile page, and if you upload a picture, for example, of a couple of cats, they, uh, they are visible there. If you have a private account, things are different, which is in the name, of course. Private account, uh, pictures, uploaded pictures are not visible by anyone. Uh, unless they have a relationship, so they have, they have befriended each other. So I, as a public account, can make a friend request to a private account. If accepted, I can see the private account's pictures, but otherwise I should not be able to. That's it. So um, how do I start on this? First of all, I don't have an Instagram account. I never used Instagram. So like anyone would start, you go to the home page and you try to register an account. Now, actually, on the website of Instagram, you can only log in. So, don't have an account, get the app to sign up. The main, the bulk of the functionality of Instagram is actually in the mobile application. So, they started with an iOS application, and quickly an Android uh, application followed back in 2010 when they, when they found it. But the bulk of the functionality is in the mobile applications. So, even with the web interface, I've shown you before, you can view the pictures, but you cannot even upload the picture via the web interface. It's all mobile-based. That's also part what makes it uh, very popular. So <laughs> I had to uh, get myself acquainted with uh, either iOS or, or Android. They still don't offer Windows Phone. Don't know if, uh, if they will ever will. Don't count but, on it. No. <laughs> I've heard uh, that the sales of Windows Phone are, are really decreasing, so don't count on it. But uh, actually, the choice was quickly made for me. I have more experience with Android, and I also find it a bit more easier to test Android because it's more open, of course. You have more tools for it. But iOS is equally vulnerable to client-side attacks, of course, but I decided to go with Android first. So anybody who has ever done some basic penetration testing before in the room? Oh, OK, quite a few. OK, so you won't be surprised that the first step that I took is to try to intercept the communication between the mobile client and Instagram servers, right? That's what you want to do if you are penetration testing. You want to look under the hood, not only fiddle with the client, but also with the traffic underneath. And typically on Android, how you easily can do this is on, on your Wi-Fi configuration settings, operating system wide, you point uh, your Wi-Fi to a proxy server and um, you start listening with your intercepting proxy tool. In this case, it was a burp suite, but you also have a zap proxy, fiddler, you, you name it. These are the same tools that support HTTP proxy, and then I'm modifying the requests and responses that run through it. Also, because Instagram is running over HTTPS, you also have to insert the certificate that this intercepting proxy tool is using to serve to the client as being a trusted certificate. Otherwise, typically the apps break, or the good apps break, let's say. So, so far, so good. Let's try it out. So, actually, quick question. How, yeah. many, how many apps will 
will ignore this the, mm. your attempt to put your own certificate in. Does that does that really work? The attempt to put your own certificate in is one thing, but in this case, even Instagram just ignored the proxy settings as a whole as well. <laughs> oh, so yeah. you have a couple of apps to ignore the proxy settings, and that was the case. So here I browse to my own blog when configured on my mobile app, and indeed I saw the request to, to my own blog. But when opening Instagram and trying to log in, for example, it just told me password you enter is incorrect. So it did a request and response to the server, but it didn't flow through my proxy. So they are ignoring the proxy settings. Yeah. Now, the second question indeed, how many apps are verifying that the certificate that is being served by the intermediate proxy is actually trusted by the device? The banking apps, I know, they do it because we advise them to do it. It's called SSL pinning indeed. But uh, there are plenty of apps who, who don't do it yet. So uh, that's, that's cert I, I cannot give numbers because I, I'm not an expert at <laughs> application-wide uh, research. But I can tell you that uh, the decent uh, banks in Belgium who I have tested uh, all do this, luckily. But uh, for now, I was, n I was nowhere, right? So I couldn't see any traffic. So I had to, had to think of another startup. Any ideas? So this, this didn't work. Any ideas on, on how to proceed in this case? VPN. Sorry? VPN. VPN, that's, that's a possibility. But how will you intercept the traffic with the VPN? You can pipe it somewhere else, but you really want to see the requests and responses, right? OK, so I took actually another uh, setup. And the basic idea is I make a, a local Wi-Fi, an ad hoc Wi-Fi network, right? With my MacBook in this case. I connect my testing device to this local Wi-Fi. And I supply my MacBook with internet, right? So that it can actually uh, allow this traffic to flow through the MacBook to the internet. Now the setup that I used is, what I could have done is just put an ethernet cable in here. So the Mac would have internet. Now what I chose to do is, Typically, I use my personal device connected to the Wi-Fi and a USB tethered. Why? Because a, a part of this testing, and actually quite, quite some bit of this testing, was performed next to the pool on vacation. And they don't tend to have wired access there. So that's why, why I chose this setup. But uh, the, other, the other thing is equally right. So this, this was the main idea. Uh, technically, how it is implemented, you have uh, your MacBook. Yeah, I have my Nexus 5 internet connection uh, connected to it. I share the internet, so the ad hoc Wi-Fi uh, channel is created. And then I start my local uh, proxy tool again, but now bound to localhost. And with uh, POF, I, I make some rules to redirect all the traffic from the ad hoc Wi-Fi network to localhost port 8080. So all traffic to uh, HTTP and HTTPS is diverted through the proxy tool. And this worked. So indeed, uh, with this setup, it was a bit more uh, difficult, but it was still rather easy to set up, even next to the pool. Uh, this worked for a, for a while, so um, now I could see the, the requests and responses flow through, and as you can see, it's requests and responses to i.instagram.com. So this is the, the server endpoint for the mobile application that they are using. So this worked in March, back in March. So that was good. But unfortunately, it stopped working in November of last year. Anyone, anyone has any idea why or what, what, what could be the root cause? Custom. Not quite. There's a thing called SSL pinning. Ah. And what is SSL pinning exactly? Basically, um, the client is connecting with the server of Instagram, right? And it's connecting over HTTPS, so the server is offering a certificate during the, the handshake. Now, this certificate is signed by the root CA that Instagram chose, and it's the one from Facebook. So they know who signed their, their certificate, their intermediate Instagram certificate, let's say. Now, what was implemented here is that Instagram will check that the certificate that is offered is not only signed by a valid root CA, because the valid root CA of my intercepting proxy tool was also on the device, it's actually hard, doing a hard code to check whether the signature is from the root CA from that Instagram used on their, on their server side. So it's really a, a check, and it's called SSL pinning, and it's also best practice to do it. And actually, the main reason to do it is to prevent uh, the hack of one root CA to, that, that it can be used to impersonate any website or any server, right? with, uh, in the case with DigiNotar and Komodo and, and so forth. 
We have a couple of, uh, we've had a, a couple of issues in the past. So that was, uh, that was unfortunate for me because I, I couldn't start testing anymore and version 7.10 proved to be a very interesting one. So that, that was also a main driver. I'll elaborate on that a bit later. But it didn't work. So how to get past the SSL pinning? Typically, there, uh, you have to modify the client because the client contains some code to do the verification check, the comparison check between the fingerprint of the certificate that is offered and the hard-coded fingerprint. So you have to modify the client, and how can you do it? Or you can modify the binary itself, in for Android it's an APK, or you can use some hooking frameworks. There are a couple of hooking frameworks, like uh, Exposed and CDS Substrate, who allow you to hook uh, inside functions, mainly Java functions on Android. And these are actually hooking platforms, and you can build a plugin for this. And a couple of uh, plugins exist that try to um, hook the functions that enforce this SSL pinning and make them work again, right? So, the, so null out the check. So I tried this one, but it wasn't working, unfortunately. And I tried a couple of others, but it wasn't working. So it was really a, a custom check uh, implemented by Instagram. And how did I find it? I took the APK from 7.9, I took the APK from 7.10, I decompiled the APKs back to their Java source code or something that looks like it. I imported it in Eclipse and I simply searched for the word pinning. So not very advanced, but it gave me a hit in 7.10 and not in 7.9, and it gave me a hit on this function. Now, I didn't spend too much time on this function on figuring out how it works. Here it says certificate pinning failure. And basically, I looked at the function, and it's, uh, it returns void, and takes some arguments, and it throws some exceptions. So I decided just to try and hot patch this function. I hot patch it in Smiley code. Typically, in APK, it's written in Smiley, and that is then recompiled back to, to Java. But it's, you, can, you can go from an APK to Java code, but you cannot modify this and recompile it again. For that, it's, it's basically one way. But you can go to Smiley, that's the first layer. And here I, I simply in inserted return void as the first statement of this function. Recompiled, you have uh, open source tools for this. I, I used APK Studio and later some automated scripts to do this for every new APK that came in. And again, I could see the traffic appear. So, yes, I could start, I could start testing. Now, zooming in on uh, the requests and responses that I encountered, this is the one to log in. So <coughs> I, I typed in ABC, ABC, and just uh, looked at the request. And here you see the post request going to i.instagram.com. And it has two parameters. One is parameter is sign body, and the other one is sig key version. So a lot of parameters. So I zoomed in a bit on the sign body. And basically, all the requests of the Instagram client it only contains these two parameters, post parameters, and the sign body is actually containing the other one. So sign body consists of 64, sorry, <laughs> 64 characters um, with a dot and then a JSON array, or let's say a JSON uh, data structure, in which the username ABC, password <coughs> ABC, and some device identifiers, and even a login attempt count are, are being sent along. Now, the hard thing here for me was, if I try to change anything in this JSON array, like for example, the username to do some kind of brute force attack, for example, it would tell me your version of Instagram is out of date. So the server would simply reject this request. Why? Actually, these first 64 characters are a signature of this payload. This is the payload and this is the signature that's being calculated. It's not just a hash, that would be too simple. It's an HMAC. So HMAC SHA-265, and it uses a key that is also embedded in the client. So penetration testing typically requires you to be able to modify payloads, because otherwise, yeah, you can look at it, but if you cannot play with it, it's pretty much useless. So in order to also be able to calculate this um, signature, I needed to find this key, which was embedded, embedded in, the, in the Android client. So typically in the, in the industry, it's called phishing, signet key phishing. So I went phishing, and I took the same uh, advanced approach. So I went to the Java code, and I looked for the word signature. 
and I hit a, I hit a function here in string bridge to Java, and it says, okay, get signature string, which after some investigation indeed, received in the, as, as parameter the payload and returned the signature. So here's where the signature calculation was being performed. Now, unfortunately, if you look closer, it's a, it's a native function, which means that the function is not implemented in Java and like the, the key to, to calculate this is not readily available in, in my decompiled Java code, no. It's implemented in one of these two libraries, low-level libraries, which are included in, if you unzip the APK, it, here is 7.10, it's libscrambler.so and libstrings.so. So here, it's loading these libraries so that th this function can be used. So I had to dig a bit deeper. I had to uh, take a look at these libraries. That's what I did. So anybody uh, is familiar with IDA Pro or Hopper? Tools that, can, that you can feed a binary and it can give you a pseudo code from the binary, even in C. So that's what I did. I found the get signature string in the strings library. I uh, reverted back to pseudo code. And here is where I got the confirmation that indeed it was an H HMAC SHA-255 calculation that was being performed. And the key to this HMAC was actually coming from the other library that was being loaded, Scrambler get string. So I thought, I'm almost there. Just need to also generate this pseudocode and I'll find the hard-coded uh, hard key here. Unfortunately, the get string function looked a little, little something like this. So this is unfortunately not a hard-coded uh, key not a hard-coded string, it's a dynamic calculation of this key. You can see here some subroutine calls as well to scramble or decrypt, so it's not that I could very easily emulate this uh, method. I could have, I could have tried to implement this myself, but the thing is, this key was also changing between every iteration after every update of Instagram. So if Instagram pushed a new application, this function was completely changed. This one is the one for 7.10. So I thought, okay, this is a lot of work, and if I have to redo this again and again and again for every new version, it's a lot of work. So I decided to take a different approach. And I used a method which was actually already documented by some other guy to also fish the key from Instagram from an earlier version. And this is actually, uh, anybody, this is actually an Android debugger. Anybody knows Oli debugger? Okay. Anybody knows Zik DBG? I didn't know either, but it's actually an Oli debugger, but for Android. So it allows you to debug native libraries of Android. Purely native libraries, not Java libraries, native libraries. So I went into the scrambler, uh, the, the libstrings uh, uh, function. Here you can see the, the get signature string annotation, the comment. Here you can see the call to scrambler get string. And here the result is being moved from register R0 to R11. I dumped the address of R0, and here was my key, finally, in the, in, the, in the dump. So this was the key, actually, that was being used. At least, that's what I thought. Now, I, of course, had to verify it, so I took this key, uh, and I fed it to some online tool that calculates uh, HMAC 275, uh, which are, with my payload, my key, compute, and indeed, if you recall, this is the signature that I got, uh, that I saw in the first request. So yay. Uh, the problem with this approach was it was working and I could replay it quite easily, but this tool is pretty unstable, so it would crash quite a couple of times and I had to attach my, my phone to my uh, VM in this case via USB. It's also a bit flaky with, uh, with MacBook and, and VMware. So in order to make it a bit more repeatable, repeatable I use an other hooking framework, which is called Frida. Anybody heard of Frida before? It's like the new kit on the block. It's really a very powerful hooking framework. It does not only support Android and iOS, but also Mac, Linux. It really supports, I think it even supports Windows Phone. And that's impressive. <laughs> but really, you should look it up. It, they have a, a nice uh, comparison of what they support and what the competitors support, like Cydia, like Exposed. They out support anybody. And it's actually, it was working for me as well on Android. So what this little piece of code does is it would attach to the USB device that's connected to my Mac, 
And it, with a hook into a process com.instagram.android, which is the PID of and, uh, Instagram on the phone. And it would simply hook the function scrambler get strings. And on the return of this function, it would output the key. So the return value, basically. Very simple now. I, if there's a new version of Instagram, I install it on my phone. I connect my phone to the PC. I start Instagram. I run this script. And then I trigger one calculation of the, the key. So I try to log in again, for example. I try to send a login request. It would go through this function. This hook would be called. And uh, on my terminal, on my MacBook, it would spit out the key as well. And this one is still working as of today. So it's very convenient for me. It's very quick. So this was my main method of, of getting this key. Now, I have the key. That's, that's, that's already one step. But I can still not modify requests and responses. I cannot, still cannot modify the payload. Or I can, but uh, I don't want to calculate the, signa uh, the signature manually, of course. So, yes? Does Freedom work uh, only does it also work if you're not jailbroken? No, it needs a rooted, uh, it needs a rooted device, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, my Android is per definition rooted, so that was not a problem. And Instagram does not contain any rooted checks, luckily. <laughs> so I had the key, but I didn't want to recalculate it always manually when playing with the requests and responses. So I wrote a plugin for my Burp Suite uh, proxy tool that simply uh, hooks into all outgoing requests. And for all outgoing, outgoing requests, it checks, OK, do I have a parameter assigned body? In that case, I will just simply recalculate the, the signature of the payload and hot patch this in the outgoing request. So pretty transparent, and it worked pretty nicely. So for those who are familiar with Burp Suite, it has a lot of modules. You have the proxy module through which the traffic is flowing, but you also have the repeater where you can replay a request. You also have the intruder, for example. And this plugin actually transparently hot patched the signature into of, of, of all outgoing requests generated by all of these modules. So uh, requests generated by the proxy, but also the repeater, the intruder, and even the scanner, which is a powerful feature of, of Burp Suite which allows you to automatically uh, scan some endpoints. So yes, we were getting closer to actual testing. This, this took me about two weeks just to investigate because I, I was not, uh, I never used Frida before, for example, so I also had to investigate this. So this cost me two weeks of, of work and no, no gain yet. Right, so uh, it was time to get testing. Now, I also found something which was not that bad. Actually, I already showed you some decompiled Java code of Instagram. And if you pay, paid attention, you can see that it's minorly obfuscated. So function names are replaced with A and B and C and parameters as well. But strings are not obfuscated in the, in the APK files. And what's more interesting, the strings that point to endpoints are also not obfuscated. So here you can see accounts login which is the, a part of the endpoint that my request was going to. And in the source code, you could also see other strings of other endpoints, accounts, change password, users lookup. And this is typically quite nice for a penetration tester because I can get a quick overview of all the endpoints of my scope, actually, of my, of my test. And what's even nicer is you have a couple of websites which host older versions of Instagram. And typically, the older the software, the more insecure the software is. So what I did is I downloaded all these old APKs. I also extracted the endpoints, and I did a comparison between one another to verify, OK, which endpoints were being added in which version, which endpoints were being deprecated in which version. Uh, I wrote a, a quick script for this. and It allowed me to see at, at every new update of Instagram to verify, OK, which endpoints have been added, which endpoints have been removed. For example, in 7.10, the one I mentioned before, a lot of endpoints got added. So, and most of the endpoints were related to security, that's, that's always a good one, and to SMS two-factor, so two-factor authentication. Instagram still officially does not have two-factor authentication, but actually they have support for it since November. So they are slowly rolling it out. I think in Singapore they, have, they are no, now testing it. But since November I've been able to either detect, uh, on one hand detect these endpoints, but also they respond to my request. So I can already start testing while nobody knows or, or Few people have, have actually knowledge of, of this functionality because simply by using the, the app, 
you cannot see anything related to two-factor, but under the hood, I can already do some testing and I actually found something uh, in this manner. So that's it for the technical setup. Two weeks of work, still nothing. But then I actually started testing. And I'll now go over 10 vulnerabilities that I found. The one is a bit more interesting than the other. Um, and actually, it's also in interesting to know in the people here who is actually more focused on application security in the room. Everybody or? Are there also some people from operations or infrastructure? Okay, I see some hands as well. So actually what I did is I divided the vulnerabilities roughly into categories. First category is infrastructure, so related to operational uh, issues, let's say. So the first one is, is titled Instagram.com subdomain hijacking on local network. And how did I find this? First of all, with these bug bounty programs, typically what uh, the bug bounty supplier says in this guy, in this case, Facebook says, okay, what is in scope and what is not? PayPal, for example, says only web servers are in scope, so only port 80 and 443, which are hosting a subdomain of paypal.com. So that's, that's the scope from PayPal. For Facebook, it's, it's much wider. They, they just say Instagram is in scope. Go have fun. So in order to know your scope, what I did in this case, I subrouted, I used a tool to brute force all the subdomains of Instagram.com. You have a, an open source tool for that called Subroot. It's uh, hosted on GitHub. I did not write it, but it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's working pretty well and it comes with a, a nice dictionary by default. So simple command, python subroot.py, instagram.com. And it spit out quite a number of, uh, of subdomains. It's based on the dictionary, yeah? so they have a large dictionary containing words like blog, uh, admin, mail, and a lot of hits came out of this. Now, most of them proved to not be very interesting, but a couple did. And one of them was graphite.instagram.com. Didn't know graphite, so I zoomed in. And actually, it was resolving to an internal IP address, a 10.213.star IP address, which is not normal, I would say. It's on a public DNS server, so a subdomain that resolves to an internal IP address in my opinion, should only be used on an internal DNS server at Facebook or at Instagram site, but not be public, but okay. That was one thing. Also, the name Graphite intrigued me. I didn't know it, so Googling Instagram Graphite turned me to the first a blog post of instagramengineering.tumblr.com, which is basically a blog of, uh, of employees of Instagram, which referred to Graphite as one of their systems to monitor traffic. And actually, the blog also contained another, a couple of other, uh, of other names of systems that they use internally. So Stats, SD, Etsy, and a couple of others were in there. So I figured, okay, it's interesting that, that I got a hit here. So I scraped all of the, all the blog posts of all this blog. I cut it all words on one line. So I made a dictionary basically of, of all the words of this blog. And I redid uh, the brute force of the subdomains. And I got a couple of additional hits. So I hit sentry.instagram.com and sensu.instagram.com, which were also resolving to internal IP addresses. So I was onto something, right? Now, my question to you is, okay, I have a couple of subdomains of instagram.com and they resolve to an internal IP address. It shouldn't be, but how could, how could one exploit this? I know most of you are, I think, in the defensive space of security. Now I ask you to think as an attacker, right? This is mainly what I do in my day-to-day -day job. It's also an interesting uh, uh, point of view. Anyone have a suggestion? Even? Try to get the server set up in internet, for instance, with those IP addresses. Exactly. So that was also what I thought. Imagine that I am on the same internet as my victim. Me as an attacker. Oh, sorry. Me as an attacker, what do I do? I claim this internal IP address, one of the three IP addresses here. I claim it, okay, it's not as simple as it sounds, but imagine that I could. I claim the IP address, I lure my victim into browsing to graphite.instagram.com, I send a mail, I include an iframe on the web page they are visiting, you name it. And, okay, I serve them, when, when they are browsing to graphite.instagram.com, I serve them the login page of instagram.com hoping that they would enter their credentials. Because there's, as advised, 
if they check in the address bar, graphite uh, or Instagram.com is there. Indeed, the top level domain Instagram.com is there, so it's trusted, right? So I sent this uh, scenario to Facebook and they rejected. They said, okay, it's an attack, but we don't actively use this subdomain. Of course, it's resolving to an internal IP address, so they are not actively using it on the internet. It would, it would not work. But the attack requires a part of local network access to claim an IP address, which is not that simple. Uh, that, that's true. And it requires some social engineering to convince my victim to visit this web page. So last but not least, also you could never, they told me you could never uh, issue an encrypted web page because we own Instagram.com, so you can never generate a valid certificate for graphite.instagram.com. So the address bar would show the subdomain, but it would not show HTTPS because it would, otherwise it would give an error. So indeed, valid, valid uh, you, you could get comments. started on Instagram.com cookies. Now we're talking. That's the next part. Ah. So this, this was a bit disappointing, but then I, I digged a bit deeper on the cookies. Ah, good one. So I, I browsed to Instagram.com, the, web, the website, right? And I logged in with one of my test accounts. And what I noticed is that the, the session ID cookie that's being set is actually having the attribute domain equal Instagram.com being, being issued yeah. by the server. Yeah. You know what it means, right? That means anything dot Instagram.com. Indeed. Yours. Indeed. So apart from that, they're also missing the secure attribute. So they only set HTTP only, but not the secure. So this basically implies that this cookie is being sent by the browser to any subdomain as well. Right. I tested this out. So incognito mode on Chrome, I log into Instagram.com. And then in the second tab, I have browsed to graphite.instagram.com. First request, I hook it with Burp Suite. And indeed, in the request, we have the session cookie from the main domain, let's say. Now it started to become a bit more interesting. Because now my, my attack scenario changed. Basically saying, OK, I still have to claim this local IP address on the internal network. It's a pretty large constraint, a pretty heavy constraint, but okay, let's assume it. If I can lure a victim that is authenticated to www.instagram.com into visiting graphite.instagram.com, even just sending a request under the hood via an iframe, the user, there's no further interaction required, then actually the browser would send along the session cookie to my subdomain, to the web server where I'm listening on, and I could use this session cookie to hijack the session. So I could copy it in, in, my own, uh, in my own browser and I would be logged in and effectively have tried this, this works. So there's no additional checking of browser uh, signature or anything like that, it would work. So I thought, okay, that's, that's not bad. So I, I resent it to Instagram, uh, to Facebook. And they basically told me, no, nah, it's, it's not working because you still, it, it's not accepted because you still rely on uh, subdomains that are not in use. You still require local network access and a part of social engineering for this attack to work, which is a valid use case. So they rejected. They told me, okay, the issue has been discussed at great lengths. So we discussed this at great lengths, but it's not eligible for a bug bounty program. And actually, they also didn't fix this. So the subdomains were still resolving to local IP addresses. And this is the part where I gave up. So I didn't have any more arguments to convince them. But actually, I should not have given up here. Anybody heard of the Instagram's mo uh, million dollar bug? Anyone read it? Read or heard about it? No. A guy found a very serious vulnerability, a remote code execution in sensu.instagram.com. But in September, so I, I found this in, in June. It was resolving to an internal IP address, but starting of September, it was resolving to a public IP address, right? And it was effectively serving something. This guy found it in September, and he was presented with this view, Sensu Admin, which is basically an open source project of GitHub, where Facebook did not change the secret in the configuration files that they used to make up for the admin cookie. So the guy, yeah, I, I will not do the whole story, but the guy, got remote code execution on this uh, sensor.instagram.com server. He found an AWS key, uh, and good to know, Instagram is completely hosted on AWS, everything. 
So he found one AWS key, which he could use to access an, an AWS S3 bucket, where he found another key, which gave him access to another bucket with everything. Literally everything, all the pictures of all the users, the source code of Instagram, the source code of the Android application, the iOS application, the certificates, the HTTPS certificates of the main, uh, of the main website, but also of uh, the, the certificates that, that they use to sign the Android application, to sign the, the iOS applications, to go to the, to the iOS store. So I was a bit disappointed when reading this blog post. We were so close. Because <laughs> actually, if I would have set up a, a bit of monitoring on these subdomains, I would also have found and, and located this. And it was, pretty, it was a pretty well-known book in this uh, open source project. So I could have found it, let's say. But I didn't. Some other guy did. And he reported this to Facebook. And that's where it got ugly. So he reported this vulnerability, the remote code execution. And you must know, Facebook has paid out over $30,000 for one remote code execution in the past, right? It, through their bug bounty program, which is a lot of money, let's, let's be honest here. So in, Facebook said, okay, that's fine. Here's $2,500 for it. For a remote code execution in Facebook, that's not a lot of money, let's say. So only then the guy decided to prove to Facebook that they were wrong and that this was actually a significant vulnerability. And only then he started hunting for the AWS key, the second AWS key, and everything. And he also downloaded a bit of this to prove it to them. But Facebook did not appreciate that. <laughs> so no like here. Basically what Facebook did, and this is really where it gets ugly, uh, at this point, when they found out that the guy, the researcher, did this, which, in my opinion, is completely out of, out of line. You, you don't go hunting for, for more if it's that sensible. But okay, the guy did. And they basically, the, the CTO of Facebook, Alex Tamos, he called the employer of this researcher, so not directly communicating with this researcher. They called his employer to say he was being unethical. They didn't sue him, but they... They put some pressure on it, let's say. Which is, of course, not nice to hear if you're doing bug bounty hunting yourself. <coughs> so this, this actually came out in a blog post. There was some rants going on between Facebook and, and this guy in the end of December. So I did not know. I will uh, think twice next time uh, if, when I choose a target, let's say. But OK, that's a, that's a story of the first vulnerability. It's a rather long one. And also, after each vulnerability, I'd like to discuss with you where the root cause of this vulnerability can be mapped on the SDLC. Now, I took a simple picture of SDLC. You can uh, discuss a lot about this. But basically, in this one, you have five phases. You have requirements, design, development, testing, and maintenance. So I'm asking to you where do you think the root cause of this vulnerability was, or root causes. There can be more. So the issue is that subdomains are resolving to internal IP addresses. That's the root cause. That, that was the root cause. Or subdomains were resolving to public IP addresses that should not be uh, available in the public space on the internet. So what I figured is, OK, the fact that these subdomains are resolving is an operational <laughs> issue. It's something in the infrastructure that went wrong. Something that had to be configured internally on the internal DNS servers got out and was configured on external DNS servers. So that's one thing. That's the second root cause I, I think is, is a valid one is the fact that the session cookie on www.instagram.com is actually scoped to all subdomains. And this is actually still the case, so they, they still didn't fix this. Which is, in my opinion, a very weird decision. But they will have their reasons, I guess, because uh, they, they know about it. So second vulnerability, still in the infrastructure space, uh, was a very simple one, actually. I looked up the DNS records of Instagram.com, and I found some dodgy-looking mail servers, right? It was pphosted.com. So I figured, let's do a port scan and see what's running there. And I found some admin interfaces on these mail servers, the official mail servers of Instagram, which are an asset, of course, if you can Compromise these, you can send out mails as Instagram.com, and probably they are hosted somewhere in, in, the, in the internal network, so it could be a, a first step in. So I found yeah, a nice <laughs> 90s looking uh, login page of Facebook, 
as well as a admin panel of the appliance that they were using, Proofpoint actually. And they were actually also using an outdated version of the appliance, as shown in the footer. A second step I took was, okay, I have a login screen, but I cannot do much with it because they don't uh, allow brute forcing, of course. It's in their rules of bug bounty. So I wanted to prove that I, I could do some harm. And I said to them, okay, I can enumerate all your employees' email addresses through SMTP enumeration. So the SMTP protocol basically allows you to, if you want to send a mail, you connect the, to the SMTP server of, uh, of Instagram. You say, I want to send the mail to admin at Instagram.com and, would, and it, would, it would say, no, you're not allowed to. I would try to send a mail to unexisting at Instagram.com and it would tell me that one does not exist. So it allowed me to enumerate uh, all the, the uh, email addresses of employees. So Jeffrey Herson, for example, is one name I took from a LinkedIn profile which stated that the guy was working for Instagram. So I proved to them, okay, I can enumerate a nice bunch of email addresses. I have a login screen here related to email. Perhaps um, I, could, I could rake some havoc, I could lock out some accounts of, of you if I do the brute force. I didn't do the brute force, of course. They would call my employer, so. But this is what I reported to them and also the fact that they were using an outdated uh, proof point protection server. So it's quite unlucky because in 7.0 there was a remote code execution bug, but uh, not for 7.1. I was in doubt of waiting a bit more to report it, but I decided to go for it. And unfortunately, they refused again. They told me, okay, it's not of significant value. And honestly speaking, it's not, it's not a big vulnerability, of course. So, okay, second attempt. Nothing uh, won yet. And root cause in this case, I believe, was also in the operational or maintenance part of the SDLC. So these appliances and certainly these admin interfaces or login interfaces should not be exposed to the internet, in my opinion. Shout if you disagree. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's probably an admin from Instagram who wants to be able to check on the, when he's by the side of the pool. Yeah, it could be. But they could use a VPN, right? Yeah. As suggested before, so. I'm honestly, uh, yeah. It's probably something like that. Or a very legacy old mail server that's not really being maintained by themselves because it's hosted on pphosted.com, so perhaps they it's not their service, they buy it as a service maybe. I don't know. So next one is not in the infrastructure category, but in the web category. And it's actually a, quite a fun one. Uh, I learned about this by reading write-ups of other people because as a bug bounty hunter, you must stay up to date of vulnerabilities that are found and being rewarded. So I read about this one on hackerone.com where you can find a lot of published write-ups of vulnerabilities that were sent. This one was actually sent to hackerone.com themselves. They also have a a bug bounty program for themselves, of course. So what's the issue here? Um, you can have a profile of your account on Instagram.com. I have my profile of a test account right here. And I put, you can put a link to whatever you want on your profile. Typically it's a blog or your, your own website or a website of, of something you're, you're a fan of. So I put here arneswin.net slash Instagram.html. Now imagine that someone clicks on it. Imagine someone visits my profile, thinks, hmm, it's interesting. I click on it. This would open in a new tab, which is not that uncommon on a web application. Facebook does it as well. So it would open directly in a new tab. But what's interesting to know, and I don't know if there are many people here in the room that, that also know about this, but actually if a, if a website is opened in a new tab from another tab, it actually gets a reference to the previous tab in JavaScript, in a variable. And actually, it can use this reference to do some things with the first step, and in this case, um, redirect the first step. No. Very weird, but this works in all browsers, and it's in the spec, right? So it's in HTTP spec, all the browsers support it. Very weird stuff to me. I, I couldn't believe it, but I tested it. It works in all browsers. So much for the same origin policy. Indeed, that's also what I thought. Because notice, I'm at arneswinde.net. It's not the same origin as Instagram.com, okay, now it's already redirecting, but it was from Instagram.com, it opens, and here I do a simple redirect as a proof of concept to my own blog again. 
Uh, typically, an attacker, what, what he do? He would also redirect to something looking like Instagram.com and serving a nice uh, timeout login, login again page. And honestly, a lot of people, even me, could fall for it because you're coming from a trusted zone. You click something, you close a tab, you, you can close this, and then the damage has already been done. So you go to your first tab, you can make a nice, uh, nice favicon that looks like Instagram, you can completely copy Instagram. The address bar will not show Instagram.com anymore, but if, if the look and feel is the same, and you came from there, few people would actually, I think, detect this attack. Right, so the first step effectively is redirected. Now, I didn't went through all the trouble to copying uh, Instagram, I just reported this, because I know um, some of these reports were already refused, and indeed, Facebook also refused this one. But in the beginning, they told me, okay, it's a duplicate, so we are aware of this vulnerability, but actually, this one is still working. So if you browse to, if you browse to uh, Instagram.com slash with a Z at the end, and click on it, you will see it happening right now. It's still working and they haven't fixed it. I also reported a couple of these to Google, to, to Microsoft, they, they all deny it because it's in the specs and it should be like that. Which is very weird to me. It's a very powerful phishing attack. Well, if it's in the spec, that doesn't mean it should be. No, <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, and they could fix with a redirector. The fix is even easier. So there's a fix that, um, here, that's, a, that's basically an href, right? Yeah. An, an A tag. And if you put in the A tag um, an, an additional attribute, like reference is no, um, source is no ref or something like that, uh, there is a one for that. It would not hand over its own reference to the new tab and it would not be able to do anything. Okay. So it's just one hot patch, one attribute that should be inserted here. But apparently, it also, under the hood, it would not send a refer header. It would instruct the browser not to send the refer header to this new tab. So it would not know where it comes from. It would not get a reference to it. Perhaps it also breaks some analytics. So I, I assume that that's the reason why they don't want it. Not sure, but it could be. But I completely agree with you that this is ridiculous. Huh? And I should watch out for these kind of attacks because they are supported and basically everybody is denying them. I invite you to, to test it out, it's still working. I, I checked it yesterday. So yes, close but not close enough. Zero dollar. Uh, root cause of this one, anyone has a suggestion? I figured out, okay, this is an implementation bug because when writing this href, a developer who knows about this problem could include a no ref uh, attribute. So I mapped this on development, but this is a long shot because it could also have been by design. They refused it, so maybe it's by design that they, that they allow this to happen. But of course, we're making estimated guesses here, of course. So next up is an actual vulnerability that got rewarded. And it's a technical one. It's not a, a logical flaw, but it's a technical one. And it allowed me to enumerate directories on Instagram's main web server. Oh, what time are we at? Okay. So, very simple. I have my OS configured to, uh, as to be in Dutch. And if I browse to Instagram.com, it would serve me the Dutch landing page. Okay. But you can select uh, another language here. And what it would do is it would add an extra parameter, home language equals, en equals English, and it would serve me the English web page. <coughs> now, I started fiddling with this a bit. I put dot slash in front of en, and it would still serve me the English page. Oh, no. But the default one is Dutch, right? So it's pretty odd. So what do you do? You try to read something else, right? <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> I used uh, percentage zero, zero to null out the remainder of the path on their end that is being appended to my, my input. But unfortunately, I got an internal server error, so I definitely broke something. But <laughs> oops, an error occurred. I didn't get to see what I wanted to see, namely the content of, uh, of this file. So I, I dug a little bit deeper, and I went to the Django documentation because through some other, yeah, by fiddling with Instagram, I also saw some references to Django. It's completely written in Django. 
So I went looking for the Django documentation about languages, language files. And there was an interesting note here saying, okay, you have the language code here that you need to supply yourself. And then the default file is here and the upper directories are called this. So I went ahead and tried to supply dot dot slash locale slash en. And it would actually serve me the English web page. If I put it in capitals, it would still serve me the English web page. If I were to replace the word locale with wrong, it would serve me the Dutch page, right? So it's it definitely being used to calculate a path of this language file. Main website, eh, landing page, eh, struck me by surprise. But unfortunately, I could, not read, I could not read pages, which makes sense. I could not read other files, which makes sense because it's actually being used to read a django.po file, which contains language encoded strings. And if I serve it etc password, it would start parsing the contents of etc password as a language, as a PO file, and this would break. So this is what triggered the error in my, in my case. So I, I, I definitely got something, but I didn't know how to exploit it yet. But then I figured, okay, I could try a brute force of directories. Right, so I found myself on FuzzDB project, a word list with um, popular directories. And I started guessing, so I started performing a, a brute force attack, a limited brute force attack, of course, with limited dictionary, for dot dot slash, and then here I would insert my guess, slash dot dot slash locale, and it, if it would serve me the Dutch web page, no. Well, I did this on, a, on an English box, actually, so the default case would be English, so if, if it would serve me a Dutch page in this case, I would have a hit. And actually, I got 42 hits. So I found out about 42 directories in Instagram's, um, on Instagram's slash Django uh, directory, which were interesting, let's say, because it, it were a lot of plugins that they are using uh, under the hood. But um, for uh, responsible disclosure region, reasons, I have not included them in the presentation. So I sent this one to Facebook, and they replied, although this issue does not qualify as part of our bug bounty program, we appreciate your report. I was not very amused. Because <laughs> I, I replied to them saying, I, I can really read all directories. OK, I cannot read files, granted. But I can see which home users you are using, for example. I can, I can see which, uh, which additional depend dependencies you have installed. And then they came around. They said, OK, the previous reply was intended for another report. <laughs> the only time it happened, of course. And then they donated my first $500, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> finally. But afterwards, I started thinking, hmm, what if I supply a lot of dotted slashes to go to the upper root, and then supply def u random with percentage zero, zero. Def u random, for those who don't know it, it's a unlimited file on Linux, right? It keeps spitting out random random uh, content, but it never stops. So if this file is to be read, this would effectively denial of service, result in denial of service. So I sent this in on the 31st of August. I sent a reminder on the 18th of October. And on the 29th of December, they came back to me saying, OK, indeed, thanks. It's a, it's a good remark. But we already considered this attack when we um, uh, donated $500 to you. So the act of reading those files does not significantly affect our infrastructure too much as we have systems in place to deal with unresponsive servers. I was a bit skeptical about this explanation <laughs> because if I can do, if I can with one request, denial of servers one server of Instagram, I could impact their infrastructure, I think. Even if they are quick with resolving, I'm also quick with brute forcing. So. I'll leave this in the middle, but still I was happy that, that I got my first bug. I mapped this one on development because it's clearly a technical implementation uh, vulnerability. And they resolved it quite quickly, only the response took a couple of months later. So next one is, uh, is related to the core functionality of Instagram, uploading pictures. If you upload a picture to Instagram.com, uh, the response contains a, a bit of information about the picture, a unique ID, and a unique code of the picture. Now, the unique ID is used internally to refer to the picture. The unique code is used to make up for the permalink of this picture. So if you browse to Instagram.com slash P from permalink slash this code, you get to see the picture if you are allowed to. 
Now, I upload it as a private account. So in this case, if you are not logged in, you cannot see it. But if you are logged in, in this case, as the owner of the uploader, you could see the picture, right, in this URL. So far, so good, that's normal. Uh, there's no, no issue here. But the, the mobile client also contains some functionality to share permalinks of pictures, even from pri private pictures. So I went ahead with my private account, I shared this private picture, copy share URL, would generate the following request under the hood, request to media slash the unique ID, internal ID, slash permalink, and the response would just say the permalink, which I already have, right? Instagram.com slash p slash this code. I already had it, but by making this request as the owner of the picture, the access control around this permalink changed. So now... Oh, so the get request has a side effect. Yes, good one. The get request actually has a side effect of modifying the access control of the picture, which should not be, get request should be stateless, not stateful, but we'll get to that on the next one. But um, indeed, this shared private picture is now accessible to the whole world. In case the whole world can predict this token. Right? So the security of this private picture, which has been shared, but maybe the, the owner accidentally hit the copy share URL button and didn't even share the URL with people, or he, he copied it and shared it with a couple of people. But now the whole world can actually view the picture if they find out about this token. And it turned out that the entropy of this token was not sufficient. So I went ahead and, uh, and examined the codes of some public accounts, uh, the codes of some pictures of some public accounts. So from the founders, Kevin and Mike, I don't know them, but I figured out they, were, uh, they had a, a a very a unique identifier, unique user identifier that was very close to each other, of course. And I noticed the pattern. So you have Kevin and Mikey, and the seventh and eighth character here. The seventh uh, differs between G and capital A. The, the eighth is, is really constant. So it's always capital B. And what was funny is, if you pick a user with a uh, user ID that's close to it, it would also have the same characters. If I'm an attacker and I want to find out about this token of a private account, I search a public account which is close to it, and I get to know these two tokens already. So two options. But that's not enough, of course, <coughs> because it was a, ten, ten, uh, a length of 10 tokens, but also it was a big character, so 64 characters actually, lowercase, uppercase, underscore, uh, dash, and, and 10 digits. So I had to go a bit further, and what I did is I implemented a monitor script that monitors the number of posts of a private account, because that is public data. It monitors the number of posts of a private account, and as soon as it sees that it's incremented, so the, the private account has posted a new picture, this one would also upload a new picture to Instagram with an attacker account. And then I compared the codes of these pictures. So these are codes of private victim accounts pictures, and these are the ones of the picture that were uploaded right after. And the first four characters also were stable, right? So the first, <laughs> turned out that the first six characters were actually based on time. Also the fifth is actually, it's quite in range, so that, that's also a reduced uh, entropy. The, the fifth, I mean, the sixth is, uh, is, is harder. So this gave me an attack surface. Because, okay, we have an alphabet of 64 characters. The first six are global incremental identifiers, of which I can calculate four, right? So two remain. The seventh and eight I can predict based on the account of, uh, of a, a public account that is <coughs> close by, nearby this user. So this gives me final entropy, 64 times four, right? Of the four tokens that I, I don't know, times two because of the seventh and eighth character, there are two options, not one. This gives three, uh, 33 million possibilities, which is in fact fairly easy to brute force with a, with a brute force uh, a scanner like WFuzz or even Burp Intruder. So I could effectively start calculating these tokens of private picture that were shared. And Facebook did decide, they, they appreciated this one uh, yet, and uh, they decided to reward me $1,000. So mapping on the SELC, I mapped this on the design phase because the token was not big enough and it was predictable. They made it a very long one this now. Now to get to your mark, indeed the get request was stateful, right? That's not good because stateful 
um, requests, they should be protected against CSRF. But in case of Intergram, they did. So any post request was protected uh, via CSRF, actually via the custom user agent that is being set by the client. So a normal browser would not contain Instagram uh, in its user agent, and the server would reject it, the web server. But the GET requests were actually not protected. Which means that if I could make a user make this request in his browser with a, a private picture, a picture ID of, of one of his private pictures, this would actually result in, indeed, the modified access control of this picture. Right? So simply browsing to this URL when being logged in would validly um, generate this functionality. And as you can see, the token has been increased with a long shot by Instagram by now. So CSRF. A lot more entropy. A lot more entropy, yeah. yeah. But of course, they have the legacy of the millions of uh, previous codes that are still there. And they can hardly update this. But uh, I won't go into that. So in order to exploit this CSRF vulnerability, which in theory works, I have to know this ID, the private picture ID of my victim, which is not public information. And also, I need to know the permalink because it's the response of this request. But of course, in a CSRF style attack, I can convince a user to make this request, but I cannot see the response. So that's, that's basically what CSRF is saying. Let's quickly connect my battery here. Yes, it works. So I had to use some other vulnerabilities, some leaking vulnerabilities that leak on one hand this ID and on the other hand the permalink of this picture. So to leak the ID I use a small vulnerability which uh, actually was a direct, uh, no, an insecure direct object reference. So if you have a new picture in which you have been tagged, for example you tagged yourself, um, you actually get a notification, and if you click here, it sends the following request. So user tags, then your own user ID slash feed, and it would return with all the pictures, the new pictures where you have been tagged in. Now, if I'm logged in as an attacker and I would supply this endpoint not with my own user ID, but with the user ID of my victim, it would still respond with the private pictures of my um, victim in this case. So <laughs> a typical IDOR vulnerability. So good, I got, uh, got my hands on, sorry, I got my hands on, a, on an image ID. Now to get the permalink linked to this image ID, it was even simpler. So logged in as the attacker, I would make the same call to slash permalink, but with the ID of a picture of someone else, and it would also reply with the permalink. Oh. But the downside was it would not change the access control of the permalink, right? It would just reply with the permalink, but only if the owner made this GET request, the access control of this picture would change. That's quite unfortunate. <laughs> it's clear? Right, okay. And this one also got accepted by Facebook and rewarded with $1,000. I was getting somewhere, right? Mapping on the SLC, the, fir the fact that it was a GET instead of a POST request is by design a flaw. Uh, the fact that uh, CSRF attack surface Basically, that GET requests to a mobile endpoint are also working on the, the main uh, domain is actually a problem of development. And they fixed this as well. So if you now replay requests to the uh, mobile endpoint on the web endpoint, they would simply deny it all. Okay, brings us to the uh, next vulnerability also in the web space, web and mobile space. If you register for Instagram, you get an email to confirm your email address. So you register with an email address, obviously. <laughs> you get a link to confirm your email address. I registered with Instagram pentestuser at gmail.com, one of my plenty test accounts. I click and I get to browse to this URL, which is basically, basically containing account confirm email, a user identifier encoded, and a base64 um, payload. When decoded, um, resolves to, or decodes to my email address that I submitted. So if you browse to this URL, it requires you to log in as this user and then your email address is confirmed. What I did is I logged in as another user. I did not log in as the user that I registered with. And in this case, I logged in as attacker and this was from victim. So in this case, it would tell me, okay, log in as victim 14 April, which is the account linked to the base64 encoded address here. This was basically an oracle for me. 
what I did is I base64 encoded mark.zuckerberg at facebook.com. I browsed to this URL and it would tell me hmm, the Instagram account linked to this email address, which is private information according to Instagram. It's, it should not be shared anywhere. It should say, okay, this is linked to the Mark Zuckerberg account. Now, for Mark Zuckerberg, it's not really a, a surprise, of course, but in countries where there is some um, uh, censorship, this would be interesting, right? If you can map email addresses of, of, of uh, activists to their Instagram account, it's, it's a bit of a leak. And this was the same for the mobile endpoint. So there also you, have, you had an account confirm email and exactly the same response, but then in a JSON array was, uh, was returned. And they effectively accepted this one as well, and they quickly remediated it and uh, served the $750 bounty. So this one is clearly also mapped on development phase. Now getting, getting into the goodies, this one is actually uh, also quite interesting. Um, Instagram states that if you, you, you have an account, right? You have registered with your email address to, to have an account. They state that if you have lost your password and you don't have access to your email address anymore, we cannot give access to your account anymore. So one of these two you must have. Right? If you try to change your password on Instagram, you have to supply your current password. But what's all this, if you, have to, if you change your email address, you don't have to supply your password. But you can reset your password through the email address. So this seems a bit odd, because if I can reset the password via here, it should also require the current password to be supplied. Now they know, they know about this, and actually what they do is, okay, if I change this one to Instagram pen testing 2, right, they would send an email to Instagram pen testing 2 to confirm the email address with the base64 encoded parameter. To the new one. Yes, to the new one, but what the old one? they also send one to the old one. They send to the old one, your email address has been changed on this date. If you didn't do this, please secure your account. And effectively, this was a scenario that was working. So if the old account would click this, it would go through a, a scenario where they can secure their account again, reset their password, and get access to their account again. Right. There, were, there were a couple of problems. First of all, um, if I, as an attacker, updated my profile with the email address of someone else that was already registered, in the web endpoint it would say another account is using Instagram pen testing, so you're not allowed. But in the mobile endpoint it would say something differently. It would say, okay, someone else is using that email address, will email you a confirmation and update your contact info once you confirm that Instagram pen testing one at gmail.com is your email address. Now they sent this confirmation mail to the new email address, right? not the old one. To confirm the old one, they send it to the new one. <laughs> so to the new one, I have the new one, of course. So here I try to, I try to register Pentesting1, right? They sent the email to my previous email address that was registered, which was Pentesting2. So I could effectively confirm this, so I could grab a hold of this email address linked to my account. And the big question was, what email address is the old account linked to now? Right? Because I overtook it, but what's, where has it gone? Uh, logging in, they just hot patch it to pentestingvictim at example.com, so a default value. Uh, example.com, it's unfortunately not in my possession, otherwise I would be able to take over all Instagram accounts. But uh, unless it gets to my possession, this was not the case. Okay, so that was one thing, minor thing. Second thing is also interesting. What if the attacker not changes the, in, the email address one time, but changes it two times? If he changes it two times, the attacker would also get sent a secure your account or reclaim your account link, right? Now, in order to be able for an attacker to change the email address of a victim, he or she should get temporary access to an authenticated session. This may sound difficult, but actually Instagram was still man in the middle able until the summer, so they were not sending everything over HTTPS. And uh, physical access to an unlocked phone is also something that you can think of as a, a valid access uh, uh, scenario, attack scenario. So what would happen indeed is, um, this is a setup. Pentesting victim has 
uh, Instagram pen testing two linked to his account. No, pen testing one linked to his account, and now the attacker is using this authenticated session to change the email address to his own email address, right? It happens once, so the email is being sent to the attacker. The victim also gets his security or account link. But then we do it again. So I update again as an attacker to the third email address, my second email address. And you can imagine, I also get this link. Turns out that this link keep on, keeps on working, right? So now the attacker has control of the account. He performs a password reset, right? Through the email address, his email address is linked, so he can do this. And we end up in this situation. The attacker has the account. He has one link to secure his account. The victim also has one link to secure his account. So the victim would go ahead, use his link, regain control to this account. And here's the problem, this link kept on working. Oh no. Yes. So it's like they, they don't have their paths correctly configured. So in the end, the attacker wins. He changed the password and he has the email address. And this one actually was fairly appreciated by Facebook. So they donated $2,000 which is already a nice amount of money. Uh, mapping them on the SDLC, the fact that chaining of secure accounts I mapped, uh, was possible, I mapped on the design. The fact that the email was sent to the wrong address, which I also very quickly modified, is mapped on development. Right, ninth vulnerability, this is actually the one who costed me the least effort and got me the highest reward. So th these bug bounty programs are really impact based. You can have a very nice vulnerability that has few impact and they would not give a lot of money. But in this case, I told you about my script where I compared the new endpoints with the old ones between binaries. And in 6.20, a new one appeared, discover slash su refill. Funny thing was, I, I used the app, of course, to trigger functionality. I never saw a request using this endpoint, never. But just with a burp repeater, I started sending something to this endpoint and it effectively responded with wrong parameters. Okay. So I deep dived into the Java code and where the string was located, it also hinted me the name of the parameters. Target ID is typically one you want to see as an attacker. So I log in as an attacking account I supply the target ID of a private account, and I was wondering what, what will it respond with. Basically, what it responds with is the user that this private account is following, which is considered private on Instagram. It's not a big thing, but there was actually a big thing, because in this case, my test account was, user, user, was following the public account Springsteen. We all know it. And in the response, there were also some references to pictures of this account he was following. He had access to it, of course. So I went ahead and okay, I started following with this private account also another private account, hoping that in this response, it would say private account A, and it would also reply with pictures of this private account. This would have allowed me to um, find all private pictures basically, or crawl all basic private pictures on Instagram. But no luck, the arrays were empty. So that was a bit sad. But still, um, the fact that I could read all the users that a guy was following, they helped patch it in a couple of hours and they rewarded me with $2,500 for five minutes of work. So this was, uh, this was nice. Okay, I mapped this on development again. Last but not least, and this one is actually one that I, I find where I was the most creative, is I could steal money from Instagram. Instagram allows to link phone numbers to accounts, right? You have to supply your, your mobile phone number and they would send you a text message with a set six digit code, pretty normal as, as part of the enrollment process. Now, it states here in the, in the app, didn't get the code, we'll call you in three minutes. Okay, so I waited and effectively they called me. Where's my mouse? Oh, sorry. Your code for INSC Agram is 507862. So it would read out loud my code in a very computerish voice. Your code for INSC Agram is 507862. So I figured, what can I do with this? 
and I decided to register a premium account number and see whether they would call this number as well. So I, I went online and tried to find myself some working <laughs> premium numbers. This was very hard. This was the hardest part of, of it all because finding reliable premium numbers is really difficult. I had to look for a couple of hours. So I tried all the premium numbers I could find. I tried to call them with my own personal phone to, f to check if they were working. None of them worked. All the free ones, of course. I was not going to pay for a premium number. But eventually I found one website, eurocall24.com, which allowed me to register a whole bunch of premium numbers. They are like resellers of premium numbers. So I went ahead and I, I registered a couple, tried to let Instagram call these numbers, but it failed. And I was almost giving up until I registered one in the United Kingdom. And effectively, I entered it on the, on the app, and I saw the live call coming in from, from California, from Instagram. So we were at the point that Instagram was directly giving me money now. <laughs> and the interesting part was, I could replay this. <laughs> I could replay, and as a proof of concept, I made 60 calls. And the only limitation was that um, I had to wait 30 seconds between each request. It's basically a, a, throt, a throttle uh, that they have on most of their post requests. So it's not really for this one. But if one, with one authenticated account, you have to wait 30 seconds. Is there a maximum charge rate you can put on the premium number? Yeah, there were, there were a couple with higher charge rates, but these tend to be also more unreliable. So the one I had was rendering me 0 0.06 uh, pounds per minute, which is not a lot. But they were calling for about 30 seconds. I, I only uh, uh, included a short part of the call in my, uh, my presentation. So total of 30 seconds. And I let them call uh, 60 times, which would result in 61 calls. And in the symbolic one pound of, of theft. <laughs> OK. So I send this to Facebook, and I get the following response. This is intentional behavior in our product. We do not consider it a security vulnerability. So my first reaction was what? <laughs> but then it came to me, this is intentional behavior. <laughs> <laughs> I have it black and white that I can do this. <laughs> right? So I had a moral dilemma here. <laughs> But eventually I decided to elaborate a bit and tell them, hey guys, okay, I have done a proof of concept with one account. Okay, I can only steal at this rate $1,500 a month, but I can happily register 100 accounts and let them all make calls to the same premium number. So they, they had no limitation on the premium number. They would all call the same. And I could make a lot of money in a month, really a lot of money. And they came around. So effectively, they, uh, they told me, after a, a couple of mails, uh, they came around and they told me, okay, we'll, do, we'll be doing some fine tuning, and they actually increased the, the rate limitation to one a day, for example. So you can still quietly steal some money, but not, but not a lot anymore. And they gave me $2,000 for it. So in the end, <laughs> not 150,000 grand, but okay. So this one is clearly also in the design. I advise them to because every country, the prefixes for premium numbers are well known, so I advise them to do some input validation, or even um, only allow a number of calls to one premium number and then consider it uh, uh, a bad one. But they didn't do it, they just uh, formed the rate limitation. So that was it, 10 vulnerabilities, a total of almost $10,000 earned in six weeks, which was more than I expected. <laughs> Sorry, how many weeks? Uh, six weeks. Actually, five weeks. I also did some uh, bug bounty hunting on united.com, but I'm not allowed to, to talk about that. But that was included. But um, actually, I, I won some air miles with that one, but that's another story. Uh, I also decided to donate a couple of my vulnerabilities, like half of them, to a charity. And Facebook even doubles the, the bounties then. So I donated this to Let Us Change, it's a charity which uh, supports uh, street children in Ethiopia. So I figured they would also uh, have more benefit from it than me. And yes, in fact, Facebook indeed paid up. And I got to keep the, the, the pound as well. So they didn't reclaim it. 
So that's it. Looking at SDLC mapping, the vulnerabilities mapped on development were six, mapped on design were five, and maintenance two. So this struck me a bit by surprise. I actually expected more in development and less in design. But uh, in design, there's also a lot of work to be done. Um, these vulnerabilities allow me to end up on the 20th place or in the Facebook Hall of Fame. They have 152 for 2015. And on the third place for now in 2016, so they were a bit mixed. But that means that 19 other people have earned more money because it's sorted on, on money value. So it's actually getting a lucrative business. Right? And it, I would like you to, to convince you at least to, to maybe have a look at it if you're interested because it's nice value for money. Uh, some advice if you're con considering it. If you are trying to look for vulnerabilities, a lot will fail. A lot have failed for me as well. You don't always every day find a vulnerability, so you have to keep on uh, working and you have to try harder. Now, while reporting, you have to be patient. I showed an example that uh, I had to wait for since from August until December for a response. So if your vulnerability is not critical, you will have to wait a long time. And if you are uh, disclosing things, like I am doing now, be responsible. All these vulnerabilities that I've disclosed here are already fixed or considered uh, <coughs> not, uh, not bad by, by Facebook. Because actually, I still have five others in the pipeline of Facebook, a couple of interesting ones, but they have not resolved them yet, so I cannot disclose them yet, but I will on my blog. So if you are interested, stay tuned. Thank you for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around for the the remainder of the day, uh, or I will take your questions now. Any questions? Actually, uh, the trick with the premium number, you can also do it against other parties. So I also found this in Google, but uh, they, they are in the progress of fixing it, so uh, I cannot say too much about it, but it's actually, you can consider this to be present at more places on the internet. So maybe you, you can also find something. Good luck.